one more sip of coffee. Welcome to the Active Teaching Lab. Um, if you've never been here before, um, in the chat, which is on the lower right hand corner, I am pasting in the activity sheet, a link to the activity sheet. This activity sheet is a way for us to um, document and have a persistent um, document of what we talk about today. So on the activity sheet, you will find a lot of resources for the theme of uh, adapting discussions to an online medium. And you will find, um, as well uh, as that, a, a table of questions that you can put in and some answers uh, that we will be able to um, use and you should feel free to add your own suggestions and answers as well. Um, and we've got some moderators and uh, folks from the, um, well, all across the lab here, we're able to um, give your own ideas and opportunities, um, your ideas to uh, on, on answers. I am not quite warmed up here yet, so allow me one more sip of coffee to, to get going. All right, so in the window now, instead of the opening slides, I will share the um, activity sheet. There it is. And you can see that things are happening in it. Um, I encourage you to have a, to add to the conversation, both in chat um, amongst yourselves, have some small talk, say hi to each other, things like that. Um, if somebody makes a joke, you know, laugh at it, et cetera. Um, that's always good. And on the activity sheet, jump in and add things. You will also notice that in the activity sheet, I've got the uh, percentage at 150%, so you can watch it and pay more attention to it, versus if I had it at 100%, which is how I usually watch it, it starts looking kind of small for you. So quick tip, if you're going to use some sort of thing like this, um, make it a little bit bigger and kind of see what it looks like on your screen, and, and maybe 2% is better. Um, ask your students, is this big enough? Is this not big enough? Um, it's easy enough to change, so. All right, on the bottom of the activity sheet, I'd also like to point out that if you don't have questions or tips, there we have a whole area of resources that we got from lab um, past and resources that we have collected over the years, as well as lab notes from previous labs on discussions and um, interactions, face-to-face -face and uh, student-to-student -student interactions. So please feel free to jump in and add to the bottom of that. Um, your own extra resources or questions as well. So in some ways we're practicing or we're trying to practice multiple means of representation, which is part of the universal design for learning and multiple means of expression. We're giving people the chat, we're giving people um, the Google document, we're giving people, uh, you can unmute your mic or raise your hand if you'd like to verbally um, speak out. This is kind of a, a, an affordance that the online space gives us that you often can't do in a classroom, or we often don't do in a classroom. I think increasingly, and especially now, um, or earlier in the semester when we had socially distanced or physically distanced classrooms, people would come with technology because it's hard to do um, synchronous discussion, I'm sorry, face-to-face -face discussions with the face coverings on at a farther distance. So we can start to take advantage of some of the opportunities that the online forum gives us. So that's kind of cool. Like that's the thing that we didn't think about several years ago when we were having face-to-face um, -face synchronous discussions or even online spaces. Like how do we use these in a little bit better way? So we're trying to show you one of the ways to do this. All right. So as I say, today's theme is adapting discussion for online. And I'm going to make a quick point right away that, or reinforce a quick point, they're different, right? Me talking to you through the microphone, through your headphones, and you seeing a little picture of me on the screen on this sheet in front of you, this is different from a face-to-face -face discussion, right? Face-to-face -face discussions are one thing. Online discussions, much different. Whether they're synchronous, like what we're doing right now, or asynchronous, where students can answer at 4 o'clock in the morning, and you respond to them at 7 a.m. after your first cup of coffee, et cetera. That's, 
that's different, right? The nice thing about asynchronous discussions is it allows people from different time zones to participate when it's right for them. It allows people who can, um, who have uh, kids that they have to take care of um, to jump in when the kid is uh, taking care of it, you know, doing something else and they have time to do that. If you have a face-to-face -face discussion or synchronous discussion, some of your students might be doing other things and having other uh, needs that they need to attend to, it, to um, that are unexpected. You know, usually in a face-to-face -face classroom, all of those external um, distractions are gone. But as we operate now in our homes, those distractions are there. Like every once in a while, you will probably hear my dogs bark in the background, and I will try to mute and I'll probably get up and close the door um, and hope that they don't and yell at them a little bit, right? That's part of our lives all the time now. All right, I'm going to do a quick check into chat here real quick. And... Julie says, will this lab talk about discussion boards in Canvas? Yes, we will. One of the things that we're going to talk about, um, because Canvas is sort of our go-to default framing structure, if you will, for the classes that we hold right now, the official learning management system that UW-Madison uses, um, I'm hoping that just about everything that we talk about today will apply to discussions in, no, I shouldn't say just about everything, but many of the things will apply to discussions in Canvas. One of the things that we're not going to talk about today, probably, are the nuts and bolts of how to do that in Canvas. So what buttons to press, what checkboxes to check, things like that. There are lots of training opportunities out there that, um, you know, several videos on YouTube and, you know, the official videos from Canvas. Um, for both instructors and students. There's step-by-step -step, step instructions on how to do these different choices um, in Canvas and, and across the internet um, from many different schools. I believe that we have some um, in our remote, I'm sorry, in our knowledge-based documents as well. Uh, we have training from Learn at UW on that, so uh, we're not gonna get into a lot of those details. Instead, what we talk about in the labs is to do different things, when to, um, have breakout groups or um, have groups in Canvas versus uh, having everybody together at, in, in one, you know, large discussion forum, as I've been having my students do. Um, and there are reasons for doing the different things. So with that in mind, what I want to try today is something I have not tried yet. And I'm going to ask for um, Karen Skibba's help with this because I know that she has done this as well. And this is a, a there's a Google slide that I've put together. And I'm just going to copy the link there and I'm going to put it in the uh, chat window here. And what I want to do is I want to demonstrate um, this idea of taking a of structuring a discussion in a small group discussion. And we're gonna do this in a synchronous manner here, where I'm gonna bring you out into breakout groups. We've got 51 attendees um, total, so let's do groups of five. And I'm gonna give you 15 minutes to, let's do 14 minutes, no, let's do 15 minutes, to talk about um, some of the challenges that you are facing or that you think you would face in adapting discussions to an online medium. So I've got instructions on that slide. And what I can do as an instructor you know, or facilitator here is I can go in to that slide deck that you jump into, and I can go in and join the groups, um, not in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, but in, that in the slideshow itself. And I can add some chats uh, windows and add some comments to the slide and say, oh, good point, or hey, I see you haven't added any, po added any points yet. Um, we're going to come back in five minutes, and I can start sharing some of those things. Now, I've never tried this before, and I suspect that many of you haven't, um, unless you've already been in preparing to teach online. And Karen Skiba, you've done this as well, right, in your Teach Online yes, at UW? Yes, I've done All right. that. Mm -hmm. So if, you are, and if you've taken that and you're familiar with that, please be a ringleader for the groups that you end up in. And Can I make more groups, though, than 
you said only five groups, and we have a lot of slides here. Oh, I'm sorry, 10 people. groups to five, Ten not groups. five groups oh, well, to Sorry about yes. that. I was going to say math. that seemed awful Backwards. large. I might yes. have misheard you. But, right. Now, the reason that I'm choosing five is because in Blackboard Collaborate, you can only see four other people plus yourself. And I found for myself, if I don't see somebody's face on a screen, it's hard for me to remember that they exist. So if I'm in a group, the four people who I see, I'll talk to, but then I'll be like, oh, wait, there are other people in the group. And then like, it sort of interferes with that. All right, so I'm gonna try to do this now. Um, if you have any questions about that, please uh, raise your hand and, um, or unmute yourself. Let's see, I'm gonna do that. So I'm going into the controls here, choosing number of groups, 10. Um, and I'm going to randomly assign you. All right, so we're going to give uh, and give it a try. Oh, I understand, Jer Jerome. Um, I'm going to allow attendees to, to switch groups. And right, there's only one right now, but there. Okay. 
how they would yeah. do it. Or in a music course, I have one instructor who has her students take roles of different uh, uh, composers, or it could be a simple role, like a facilitator or a note taker. Or so it's mainly what roles might you want to have in the discussion oh, forum to either make it more engaging or to make sure that they have everybody's taking uh. the lead. In Canvas, you can assign a leader. Um, in Canvas, it gives you the ability to check you're going to be the leader for the discussion this time. I've never tried it, so I don't know how that works from the student end. So you could have different roles for the students. Excuse me. Um, oh. What's happening? What's happening?
Okay. <laughs> well, that was all exciting for me, my first time doing that. Just going to give people a little bit more time to come back. Okay, so the countdown worked. That was that was the positive thing about this experience in this first time trying this. It looked like you all figured out how to get to your slide, so countdown, yay. Finding your slide, yay. Um, how were the, <laughs> thank you, the countdown, we're giving that two thumbs up. How was the prompt that I gave you? So adapting um, in your group, come up with a challenge and some structures to address them. Was that as clear as it could have been? Can you think about ways to make that clearer? And I'm, it's in some ways it's a rhetorical question, um, but think about fewer boxes would have been better, right? Okay, because it looked like you had so much to do. And if people need more boxes, they can. We've had some people that um, had a lot of boxes and you know added rows underneath, and we had some that um, didn't. And a lot of that has to do with the nature of the individual discussions, right? Um, Oftentimes, I've, I've been in this activity on your end um, several times now, and in several of those activities, we had a great conversation, but we didn't really put a lot on the slide. And that was okay. Like, that's an okay thing because we had a good conversation. Um, in other times, we went gangbusters on the slide, and um, it was just kind of a cool thing to fill out um, and, and to be able to document all of those things. All right, the challenge, all right, Julia, blah, 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 blah. Julia says, the challenge part makes sense. Wasn't sure what the other, some of the other columns meant. All right. Yes, yeah, John, so. my group was confused on the roles, for example, so I explained Good. it, but uh, they didn't know what the roles part meant there. All right. Let's, defining success is helpful. That's a really good, oh, yeah, I should have had almost a rubric or an example. What I could have done is had a slide that, had examples. I think that that, that, that would have been a good idea. Yeah, what I mean, Timo. Is that, you know, you, what you said was really important, that, you know, some people filled out the slide, all the slides and some people didn't, but the conversation was helpful. I'm getting a sense of, you know, what that expectation, uh, what, you, what you as the instructor want them to get out of that uh, experience, I think is yeah. helpful. Some people might freak out about, you know, not completing the task, uh, but that wasn't the, the, the point wasn't to fill out the, the cells, it was to have the conversation. So. Right, right. The conversation or the, the, the filling out the cells is just, again, it's a way to document. It's a way to um, give people a, a shared space so that it's not just a conversation. If they, if they need that second uh, visual stimuli, some people like to sort of keep notes. I can't keep notes. Like, I can't write notes anymore, it seems. Um, so I need a screen that, that lets me um, keep track of things there. Um, We've got things in the discussion saying it's too overwhelming, right? And you are probably right. Um, some choice is good. Too much choice is difficult, right? So we've got three things, go, four things going on in this active teaching lab. And I, again, I appreciate you playing along with this and being in that sort of, oh my God, where am I space. Um, the audio, right? We've got the chat window. We've got now, uh, Google Doc and a slide thing. That's that's a lot of places to go. And unless you've got, you know, five monitors, it's difficult to keep track of that. So too much choice is difficult. Too little choice feels constrained, maybe too constrained sometimes. So, all right, Beverly says, good to acknowledge that um, some are task oriented and some are people oriented. Yeah. So the task-oriented need um, clarity on what the goal of the activity is, and uh, the people-oriented probably don't care what the goal of the activity is because they just want to talk to each other. So good. Um, Julie talks about negotiations. I imagine that a lot of you, you found yourself in a group, and you had to sort of say, what are the expectations of this activity? And then you looked to the slide, and hopefully it gave you some clues. Um, the clues were not great necessarily. Uh, you all got the challenge clue, 
But yeah, roles, there were a couple of people, a couple of groups that said, what are these roles? What do they mean by that? Um, prompt, so I was not clear on that. And in some ways, um, this is like a pretest. It was early on in, in this lab, and I wanted to see, can we figure this out on our own, or, or where are we as far as understanding these things? So we can break this down. So looking at the grid over there, we've got challenge. What is the challenge that you'll have with an online medium? And everybody will have different challenges. Some people's challenges are very specific, like how do we get people to talk? And others are like much broader, like how do we fix discussions? Like that's a tough, tough um, choy, uh, challenge to, to fix. So what I meant by possible roles was if you can add a structural piece to your discussions, and this is whether it's synchronous like we're doing here, or whether it's asynchronous um, in groups in Canvas discussions, if you can say, okay, groups of five, one of you will be, and the thing that I've often used for controversial readings is, one of you has to agree with the author, and I assign that, right? And the next person has to agree with, um, has to be sort of a, a devil's advocate, and disagree with the author and bring in two, two, extra, um, two extra sources to support your assertions. The third one is a mediator. That's a tough one because you've got to say, A, you're right in this case, and B, you're right in this case. Bring it together. Here's a third way. That's a tough one. And the fourth person in the group, um, and this would be in groups of four, would be, the, uh, would be a, a, a troll, internet troll. So their job is just to sort of get in there and be sort of snarky and mean and not helpful to the situation. Now, they all have to demonstrate that they've read the articles, of course. Um, but they read one article, and they come at it from different perspectives or different roles. So that's sort of a content roles. Karen, go ahead. You can also have roles like uh, based on reality, such as in business, maybe you're the CEO and you're going to give the perspective of the CEO or you're going to give the perspective of the employee or in healthcare, you could be the doctor yeah. or the, the patient. So you can also do roles like that as well. Yeah. Engineering versus accounting versus advertising, right? Those are three classic, you know, um, <laughs> um, competitions in, in a business, uh, right? So yeah, that's another one, re reality-based um, roles. And another one could be administrative roles. So person A is the, is the timekeeper, person B is the reporter, person C, their job is to summarize um, things, and person D is to, I don't know, keep things rolling all along. All right, and good stuff in the discussion here. And again, I wanna encourage anyone to jump in and ask questions as well. Um, but let's go in to um, start thinking about, were there any discussions in your small groups that you had a, sort of a, within your group, you didn't understand what the, or you didn't have a good answer for? Anybody would like to share a, a difficult, challenging question or challenge um, that their group discussed? Yeah, go ahead, Sam, and thank you. No worries. It, was, it wasn't a, we didn't get a chance to discuss it, I think, or flesh it out as much as we probably would have liked, but that's, you know, that's fine. I understand, obviously, this demonstrates, but it was, um, how do you sort of compensate for the lack of body language um, in these discussions? It's, you, humans are so wired to look at each other's faces, uh, you know, the body cues, that sort of thing, like, and it's suddenly very difficult because you don't know how your peers are responding to you um, or, or it gets even how you're expressing yourself. Um, yeah. yeah. How, how do you overcome that? Is, the, is there a way or is it just something we have to learn to deal with? So this is, this is a, a great question. In face-to-face -face discussions, we've got all kinds of nonverbals, right? We, we smile, we nod, we, we um, gesticulate and we emphasize and we pound and, you know, all of these things happen and we raise our voices and we lower our voices and we speak soothingly and we speak assertively and all of this happens and you lose that when you're typing stuff up unless you use all uppercase, right? That's one way. Um, emoticons or an emoji that we can add right now, right? And that's something that is increasingly part of our modern uh, literacy right now, right? We start employing these things. So how do you do that in these very stripped out 
formats of all text. Um, Erica, you've got an idea? Um, oop, sorry, I always <laughs> mess up the buttons. Um, so no I worries. actually was in um, Sam's group and I was about to share this. Um, do you mind if I steal the screen for just a second? Let me make you a presenter so you can do so. I don't know how, you know, like realistic this is for certain kind of classes, but at least if you're um, having discussions a manageable size, maybe like under 20 people or something on Zoom. Um, I think this might be fun thing to get your students to try. Um, mm -hmm. Give me one second. I'm sharing a screen. Right now you'll see. Do you guys see my screen right now? Still seeing you. Mm. Oh, here we go. Oh, there it wow. is. Okay. Do you there see it is. my Twitter screen? I see a Twitter screen thread. Okay. Yep. So this is something that you can download. Um, it's actually a technology off of Snapchat, but you can actually install it for your Zoom. Um, so this guy came up with a way uh, so that your <laughs> lens basically recognizes your gesture. So people can just do some really basic communication, like yes, no, hello, I'll be right back. Question, that's another one. Um, can you? Take the link to that and throw that into chat for yeah, us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I installed it on my Zoom. It was fairly straightforward. Um, oh my gosh! And I'm gonna stop sharing. <laughs> How do I stop sharing? Stop sharing. Um, you've got to click on the little. There you go. Yeah. Um, so I installed it on Zoom and um, I tested it out. It works. It doesn't work with the background. Um, so you have to get rid of a background if you have one. But uh, you can try it out or get your students to try it out. Um, I don't think it works on BB Collaborate or Teams. Um, but right. uh, if you use Zoom, give it a try. I think it'd be kind of cool and fun, at least fun to experiment with. Uh, yeah, so and here's the thing about, um, so in Blackboard Collaborate or Teams, um, so if you're doing a discussion in Canvas, for example, um, all you have as far as that is the thumbs up. Right, you can set up your discussion so that it has a thumbs up. Now, the way that I use thumbs up, and I'm gonna be talking to my class about this earlier, but since they're all here right now, let me just say it right now. I've always thought of the thumbs up as an acknowledgement. It's a nod. It's, I see, I've read through your thing, thumbs up, thank you for contributing. It's kind of like a smile and a nod, and I'm paying attention. Beyond that, I can jump in and respond, right? So if you say something and I'm like, ooh, I wanna to respond to that, I can reply to that. That's really limited in Canvas discussions. In the chats here in Blackboard Collaborate, we've got a whole set of URL, I'm sorry, of emotion, emoticons that we can jump in with as well. But then you've got to do the, you know, um, in chat, you've got to do the at Erica, colon, you know, thumbs up on sharing, the thumbs up on sharing there I hit return and so we can do that but it's a little bit awkward right Microsoft Teams gives us a lot more and we can respond and give thumbs up to individual um, points in there and Zoom has their own other alt options and um, so a lot of these they're like some fake ways to get some of that those nonverbals back but they're not they're not as great as just getting people in there to unmute their mic and raise their hand and, and say stuff. Um, do other people have other ideas on that? All right. Are there other things that you came up in your groups with that um, are challenges that you didn't have good answers for that you'd like to ask everyone? Yeah, go ahead, Julia. Oh. Um, so this is actually a challenge we didn't really get to, um, but I saw some other people having similar um, challenges in their on their slides. So I, I was hoping some people might have talked about possible solutions, um, which was how to get like through the awkwardness. Um, of like asynchronous discussion and how to have authentic discussions asynchronously. Yeah. And of course, the answer for how to get over the awkwardness is to have a traumatic shared event together. 
um, right? And then you all have survived that, if providing everybody survives. Um, you've all survived it, and you are bonded together, like we've seen this in um, all kinds of TV shows, right? But what are the traumatic events that aren't, aren't really traumatic, but you have to do? Um, one of the things that I did in, in an early class was um, I would have students create videos. So everybody had to create a three-minute introductory video that introduces who they are and, and what they're um, about their, their lives. And they hated doing that. But once it was done, they all watched it together. I brought in some popcorn. This was back in the days when we used to meet together. Um, and we shared popcorn and we watched everybody's things and you know they had that moment of trauma and then it was the laugh and you saw somebody else have the moment of trauma and after that week we knew each other and we had sort of ha learned to trust each other so how do we build those um activities where people trust each other i think that in smaller groups you can do this, right? So you were in groups of five and you started to talk to each other and now you know four other people. And now you trust four other people probably more than you trust the other strangers in this list of, of, of participants. And Karen Skiba, you had an idea? Well, I just know that when I'm doing courses, nobody wants to be the first to post. It's like, oh my God, I don't want to be the first one to post. So I might reach out to individually to, to certain students and say, hey, would you mind just posting first? I'd really appreciate it. And I make sure I give them a lot of recognition for being the first. Or I might just post, hey guys, you know, even if it's a group discussion, really looking forward to your comments. Or I, I even post sometimes the a first question for somebody to respond to in the question form or a share resources form because I have different ones. And I find that uh, if there's one in there, then things will happen. But sometimes I have, you know, if I don't think is posted in one, nothing will be posted for a very long time because people don't want to be the first. So either you can be the first or ask one of your students to be the first and that helps set the stage. Yeah. And the more that you know each other and sort of call on each other, so, um, one of the things that I do and am currently doing is I'm having students sort of learn about each other. So we've had several discussions, and this is only with, up, I think we got 15 or 20 um, participants, but they're reading everything from each other. So that's a large group for a discussion. And later on this semester, we're going to be breaking it up into smaller groups um, where they'll have a much more um, closed uh, discussions within the smaller groups. But in Canvas right now, I want everybody to share, you know, why they're here and what they're working on so that they can learn from each other and respond and react to each other. And that's a way of sort of getting to know each other. Um, and it doesn't matter who's first or who's second or, or, or whatever, but I'm hoping that it'll, um, that it'll affect, it'll affect that um, team building, if you will, or cohort building. Very good. All right. Beverly, can you raise your? Yeah, well, you don't even have to raise your hand. I've got this. I've I've got you here. Trust is relative. Back to people who are oriented, people oriented versus task oriented. You and a lot of your students just want to get the work done, um, and you'll see that in example after example after example. Your students might not be as into the course content as you who've dedicated your life to it are, right? Um, so they just want to do what they need to do and then get on and go take care of the other things that they need to do right now. So getting past that, do we have any ideas on, on, on how to do that? In this case, it might be something where you need that extrinsic um, discussion. Go ahead, Beverly, and thank you. If you can unmute yourself, Beverly, and to unmute I have to click share and allow every single time so it's a little bit of a delay but I bring this up because um, this is something that I've struggled with through all of my education as well as being a teacher is that we just we start talking about students as if they're like one uh, homogenous populace and we design for a kind of full homogenous populace and then there are That's all these different abilities within that populace that uh, whose needs are not being met, and then that in your reviews. 
And so um, I think one, it's 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 kind of dual design, if you will, in the sense that it's like, okay, some people are gonna need connection, so I'm gonna create this opportunity for them to have that moment. And then other groups are gonna need uh, to clarity in order to get their work done. And so like when we um, switched into groups, um, there's the awkward silence because it's like, okay, who's gonna talk? Who's gonna assume the leadership role? Um, and then it's like, okay, should we in one group that we kind of were in and then we were out, it's like, okay, um, we're gonna talk a little bit first. And then in the second group that I kind of magically ended up in, <laughs> It was like, Sorry let's just that. write it all down. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you, it just in shifting between two groups, there were two totally different approaches, which are probably based on the population of the people that were in those groups. So I think to me, it's about being aware that these populations exist. There's tons of research on this and designing to both so that both people get their needs met and negotiating that, okay, we're going to take three minutes for introductions for people who need to be connected. And then the rest of the time we're going to do X, Y, and Z, but not assuming that people know are even self-aware enough or know that they need this and they just might be getting frustrated. Absolutely. Thank you. And you're going to love our discussion on universal design for learning this afternoon after, after, um, after the lab. Um, yes. And every time you change it up, you have to renegotiate. Like that was, I think, a, a really smart point. Every time that you change things, people are in with different people and they've got to say, okay, what is my performance for this group? What's appropriate, what's not appropriate? And that all has to be socially um, constructed every time. So that gets us to another really big point about this. And that is the more you do something, the easier it gets, right? So this slide activity that we did today, it was confusing and awkward and I messed up, but next time I'm not gonna mess up, at least not in that way, um, but maybe I'll mess up in another way. After I do it three or four times, I'll have it figured out. If you've done it three or four times, you'll have it figured out as a student um, or as a participant. So that sense of repetition of like, oh, we did this before with the very low stakes, and so we were figured it out and we were able to take risks and, um, you know, ease into it in some ways. And the second time we did it, it's a little bit harder maybe. The third time we did it, it's, it's now it's easy. You know, we figured out how to do this. Um, so that's another, another big one. All right, so this was my first time doing that slideshow and um, thank you for all participating on it, um, in it. I would like to get back to the activity sheet real quick. I recognize that um, that activity took a lot more time than I thought it was going to take, and the, the debrief of it um, has as well. So I'd like to give a, a big plus one for everybody who's been jumping into the activity sheet as well. We've got some um, questions about um, how do we get the students to mic up? How do I keep track of what's happening in the chat in the chat window, as well as what's happening um, in my lecture, for example, or in a conversation? And we got some good answers um, from the smart people who are all in the room here with with with, with us. So, oh, I love this. Really good job, everybody, for your uh, really thoughtful responses. I want to, I'm scrolling down now to see if there are any that have not been answered and, and they all have been. Awesome. Thank you all for jumping into that. There are a couple of resources that I do want to make sure that I point out in the last few minutes that we have. Um, a lot of this is about socialization and building trust as we've said. Um, so trust your students and one way to show that you trust your students is to ask them and to respond to them. So ask them. Um, again, they're in a lot more classes than, than you're in and they can see a lot more of what works and what doesn't work than you can. So say, hey, what are you doing in other classes that's working really well? This exercise that we tried didn't work so well, you might say, and uh, so we're going to give it up after the second or third time that you try to make sure that it really doesn't work. Um, but then Try that. Ask your peers as well. 
And um, I really want to point out these resources that uh, my colleagues uh, Timo and Sid, who are with us today, um, have put together. A bunch of other people contributed to them as well. Um, new resources on the um, sort of designed for this remote instruction environment. So that's a, a good one. And that's the online resources here. I want to reemphasize that structure is very important. And we've seen this in the chat. And it's a thing that I'm not very good at. And I actually like the free flowingness of it. So I'm not good at that. So I need help doing that. Um, but I try. I really want to point out uh, five tips for online discussion boards as ways to structure that. And I've got some quick. Um, suggestions here. Uh, those are the five ways. Read about them more in that article that's above there. Um, and we've got links to rubrics down below, but having a rubric so that the students have that expectation, um, so that the ones who just want to get in and do what they need to do and then get up, give them that opportunity to do that um, by giving them that rubric. And maybe eventually they'll get into it and they'll see why they should jump in and do a little bit more than maybe your rubric suggests. All right, so in the last two minutes, I want to uh, focus back in on, on you all and ask if there are any questions that are still burning. Um, this is a much bigger topic than we could possibly talk about in an hour. So I really want to prioritize the questions that, that you have that maybe we could answer so that you go away thinking, ah, we didn't talk about everything, but we did answer my question. Go ahead in chat or in, um, Raise your hand and, and say it. And as I pause for that, I'm just going to read through chat. Barb Anderson brings up a really good question, or a really good point. Um, Tell them do not send eight hours of lecture for students to watch outside of synchronous times in two days. All right, so this gets to the, hey, we're online. Let's just add this extra thing. Let's add this extra thing. Uh, don't make it a course and a half. Try to be cognizant of, am I asking too much of my students right now? Am I asking more than I usually do? All right, Laura Berry suggests that if you use the post first feature in Canvas, then nobody knows who is first or who is not. That's a really good one. Any other questions here? Are you all still with me? It's 2 o'clock. Um, I'm going to stick around for the next few minutes. Yeah, Lane, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, I'm here. All right, excellent. Thank you for being here. Um, and thank you all for coming. Please feel free to um, stick around for the next few minutes um, and leave if you need to leave. If you're in our Leveraging Technology to Teach class, um, go take a 10-minute break and come back at 2.10, and we will jump back in and um, discuss what's happening in your projects. So thank you all.